Show, and I want to welcome you to this special session on COVID-19 and connecting it to STEM education. I'll be driving this presentation using a PowerPoint, so you don't get to see my pretty face for the rest of this presentation. However, remember, I'll be answering questions about this presentation and other questions that you might have about COVID-19 in a special Zoom session, which will occur on Thursday. And plus, I am repeating this session. I'll be repeating this session tomorrow. So let's get into the presentation itself. And right now, my screen should be shared with you. This is COVID-19, a landscape for STEM education. And you are all welcome, and I am honored that you're with me. Just to give you a little bit of my background so you understand where I am coming from in this presentation. I started off as being a biologist at Woods Hole. I taught up at Boston University, did my research up in Boston and down in Woods Hole, also taught at the School of Nursing but decided to leave university and began teaching K-12 for 10 years. During that tenure, I've written quite a few books. Uh, also, I hosted a number of television shows for Nat Geo. But if I look back at the piece that I am most proud of is developing the U.S. national curriculum on teaching HIV. Along with that, we did a television show, which I was architect of, which went to the Discovery Channel. We featured a uh, younger Anthony Fauci on there, and we were honored to be nominated for an Emmy Award for keeping kids safe. And that is what is driving me in COVID-19 education. Goals for this presentation are as follows. First of all, I want to empower you with understanding, and this will be a primer on the science of COVID-19 and also the virus, which is SARS-CoV-2 which causes that disease. I wanna profile the COVID-19 STEM connections and also give you an update on vaccine development. First, let me point you to applicable resources because this is a very short time that I have with you. It's just 45 minutes and there's plenty I can say. So the first resource I'm gonna point you to is my Twitter account. There is no cats or cappuccino on this Twitter feed. All it is about science and science education. For those of you unfamiliar or not familiar with Twitter, you can go to your web browser, put in the at sign M Despezio, and you will get quite a collection of tweets. Uh, once you put that in, your Google Chrome might open up these recent tweets. Just click on one of them and it gets you into the hierarchy built on dates of my Twitter posts. Now these posts really include a variety of subjects, everything from, you can see in the top left corner here, a post on schools reopening. And the latest is CDC document that was somewhat released earlier in the week on what we need to do to ensure that we have safe schools to a fantastic scientific American article, which is free. I will post to free sites and free articles so you don't have to invest anything. Also on my Twitter, you're gonna notice that I have embedded movies and visuals. And this is phenomenal. This shows what happens when one exhales with or without a face mask. A very powerful video which illustrates really the change in thinking that World Health Organization just subscribed to a few days ago, which scientists have known about for the past several months about the aerosol or the potential aerosol infection route for COVID-19. Also, if you want a deeper dive into this, you can check out my blogging at COVID19MichaelDespezio.com, uh, where I cover certain topics all about COVID. Plus, I've got online lessons. You can point students to this. You can point your teachers to this. This is the latest lesson I just posted yesterday. In the flood system to the site of injury 
or infection. And there, they can change the permeability of blood vessels, which allow other immune cells to go out of the bloodstream. So you can see that there's quite a few resources that I have posted. You can get to them all through that Twitter. So please join me at Twitter, subscribe to my feed, and you'll get a daily update on all of the pieces that I go through the night before and the ones that I call down and I profile, which I think are most appropriate to educators. A note on standards. As a science author, I am driven by standards and NGSS really sets the ground for what I am looking for in sharing with students and sharing with teachers and administrators for how you best approach science education in 2020. And if we look at NGSS, one of the basic tenets said that we're looking to prepare students to be better decision makers on scientific and technical issues, especially when it comes to issues about health. And the COVID-19 pandemic is really setting a very rich landscape for us addressing STEM in many different ways. Also, especially when we begin to look at STEM, many people focus more on engineering, the big E that comes out of that acronym. And in NGSS, we look at raising the engineering design concept to the same level that we have as scientific inquiry. A couple of things about engineering challenges. When teaching COVID-19, there are many types of engineering challenges. So it's important to look at how you can integrate this concept into what we're teaching as far as content-wise goes. Primarily, students need to know that science is not engineering. Engineering is all about solving problems and meeting needs. And we'll talk about that later. First, let's go and take a little bit of a background look at the outbreak itself. December 1st, 2019, we look back and we find in Wuhan, China, there was an individual who presented with symptoms of pneumonia. And pneumonia can be caused by a number of different agents, but this individual, elderly man, came, presented with cough, difficulty breathing, loss of appetite, and fever. And normally, something like this, if it was a single individual and they could not find the cause, it's written up in journals, it's shared, and then it just kind of disappeared. However, what had happened was that following this individual, there was a cluster of individuals having the same symptoms in and around Wuhan. And in fact, there was a specific concentrated cluster right here in this area, which was the Hunan Seafood Market. And by January 2nd, about half of the reported cases, and there's real questions about the reporting on this, but about half of the reported cases had some sort of link to this market. And it was a wet market. And if you're familiar with wet markets, I know a number of you travel, uh, you have all sorts of critters that are sold there, everything from bats to poisonous snakes. The critter, the animal which was considered as being a possible vector for this infection was the pangolin, the scaly anteater. That is really in question right now. Uh, it made a good story, but we'll talk more about the role of this intermediate host as we dive deeper into coronaviruses. Originally, they thought that this individual was patient zero, known as the index case. And most likely, he was not. Why? He was elderly. He had symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. He lived several bus connections away from the market. So most likely, he did not initially become the first case of COVID-19. It will probably return to the market. I don't know if we'll ever know, probably not. However, what epidemiologists and science do know now, if we begin to look back, is that there were cases in November, probably in October, and if you're following recent publications, this may even go back earlier to the previous year. Engineering challenges, and I love looking at these, many of them for students in medical technology. Again, depending upon the level of sophistication, what grade band we're looking at, students could look at developing thermometers, possibly non-touch thermometers. What about telemedicine? How can they develop 
a piece using video cameras to find out how someone else feels. Contract tracing, are there ways to develop strategies for this that students can do? Certainly in high school, they can think of this. What about quarantine compliancy? How can they develop pieces for quarantine compliancy? So as you can see, there is a rich landscape for connecting engineering challenges to studying COVID-19. Well, before long, it wasn't before long that, that COVID-19 was identified as a disease which was caused by a corona virus. And here is an image of a coronavirus. It gets that name because it has a halo, a corona or a crown-like appearance, which is caused by spikes that project from the mostly spherical shape of the virus. And those spikes are called the S protein. Coronaviruses have been known for a while. There's a number of them. Uh, in the 1960s, they were studied. Uh, they were found to be the cause of the common cold and maybe about 10% of the cases. Uh, generally, they produced mild to moderate symptoms of illness. So they were not considered deadly. However, that changed in 2002 in Guangdong province, China. We had another disease caused by a coronavirus which emerged, and that was called Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS. It produced deadly symptoms. Here's a picture of SARS-CoV, and SARS-CoV is the name of the virus that causes SARS, and you can see that corona-type appearance. Now, the SARS virus is zoonotic, and zoonotic viruses jump host. So there is a reservoir of the virus in bats, which is transferred to civets, a type of cat, which then transferred to humans. And that is the route that SARS took to get into the human population. 2012, Saudi. We have another coronavirus disease. This is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS. And MERS also was caused by a virus, and this was MERS-CoV, the name of the virus that caused this deadly disease. This too, as in all of the other coronaviruses, is zoonotic. This one jumped host from the Arabian camel into the human population. So there was no intermediary. December 2019, Wuhan. We're already describing this pathogen causing COVID-19 as the SARS-CoV-2 virus. However, the WHO decides to call it the COVID-19 for fear that this might alarm people who knew how deadly SARS were. You know, in hindsight, we can look back and say, well, maybe people should have been warned more about the deadly potential of this disease. Epidemic expanding outbreak. So we have this outbreak occurring in the clusters in December 2019. By January 1st, there were about 60 cases of pneumonia with unknown causes. This keeps progressing. January 13th, in Thailand, we have the first out-of-country case of COVID-19. January 20th, possibly before. Again, we need to look back at symptoms. Nothing is absolute when it comes to these numbers. Uh, probably the first U.S. case recorded in the state of Washington. By January 30th, the World Health Organization declares a public health emergency. And you can see what a wonderful dashboard this is. Uh, and I'll mention that in, in a moment. Pandemic. When do we get to a pandemic stage? Pandemic is subjective, highly subjective. If one looks at a pandemic, one can really define a spreading epidemic as pandemic, depending upon what may be possibly political, maybe more of a deeper understanding, but it's really an epidemic that is spread to several countries or continents affecting a large number of people. And on March 12th, the World Health Organization finally calls COVID-19 a pandemic. This, by the way, is that John Hopkins dashboard I mentioned before. It is a fantastic dashboard giving you updates. And when this first appeared back in January, February, February is I think when I first 
found this dashboard. There were several ones which were competing to be the best one. Without a doubt, the John Hopkins site rose to the top. So I would highly suggest going here because not only is it a dashboard with numbers, as you can see, but it also gives you deeper dives into these numbers by clicking on various parts of this interactive screen. You can get there using the address or just go to my Twitter, I point to it. R naught value, an important number when it comes to understanding when we should reopen and when we should not. This R naught value is also a great handle for introducing mathematics, the M in STEM, into student learning. And this really is the expected number of new cases that one individual is likely to infect. And this is without mitigation. And at an R naught value of one, one infected individual infects one other person. So we have a leveling out of the spread of the disease. If we have numbers above one, the spread is increasing. We don't want to be there. We want to have one or lower to look at reopenings. And if we look at the R naught value, and R naught values are interesting because again, they're not absolute. It depends upon where you are. It depends upon what we understand about the virus. The more that we learn about asymptomatic carriers, the more that that impacts the R naught value. To give you an example of R naught, measles is nasty. Each individual, unmitigated, could probably affect between 12 to 18 people. Chicken pox, 10 to 12. The common cold, two to three. Seasonal flu, about one to 2.1. COVID-19, the original thought was about 1.4 to 3.9, but the latest thinking places that number up at maybe 5.4. I've even seen the value of six. So it depends upon the population that you're looking at. So why do epidemics spread so rapidly? Again, a great STEM connection. It's the old rice on the chessboard fable. And if we look at this rice on the chessboard fable, what we can consider is a great story where a servant works for a king and does this job for the king. And the king says, oh, I love what you've done for me. This is, this is perfect. Uh, how can I reward you for your excellent service? And the servant says, you know, your majesty, I don't ask for much. Let me have a chessboard. And they bring out a chessboard. And he says, you know what I'd like? I would like one grain of rice placed upon the first square of a chessboard and two grains of rice on the next square. I want you to double that four grains on the next, eight grains on the next, 16 grains. And the king is looking, sounds fine. And, and the servant says, you know, just do that until you fill up the entire chessboard. And the king figures out that, hey, I just made it. This is great. And so he says, okay. And the king does this. About halfway through putting the grains on the chessboard, the king realizes that he's been taken because the numbers are expanding exponentially. At the beginning, the increases aren't great, but towards the end, they are astronomical. In fact, by the time you got to the 64th square, you'd be placing, look at that number of grains of rice. Well, let me give you it in, in another way. That is equal to 300 times the global production of rice. The king wasn't happy. I think he killed the servant as far as that fable goes. But you can get a feel for geometric progression. And again, a great way of integrating math, the M in that STEM, into the classroom. I have a number of activities I've written specifically on COVID-19. Uh, this is one that my publishers, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, have available for people. You can go to HMH, put that down. You can access a number of PDFs for various types of activities. This, again, we're looking at a STEM connection for use in math, for use in the STEM classroom, and even the science classroom. Or you can get the access through my Twitter account, all-in-one shopping. What about for younger kids? There's a great STEAM activity that I connect to the spread of disease and to stop the spread. And this is for much younger students where they would make a picture of themselves. And there I am, happy, smiling camper. Next thing, 
I would be doing is drawing an outline of my hand, cutting out that outline, placing the outline over a tissue, over my face, and then coming up with that art project and using that art project as a subject to explain how you can limit the transmission of a virus, all for young people. Now it's time for you to become a student. What I want to do is present a little bit of the science, the S in the STEM, and do this at a level that I trust is acceptable to everyone. I'll show you a variance in sophistication from the upper elementary up until the high school level. To understand COVID-19, you have to understand the virus, SARS-CoV-2, that produces this disorder. And SARS-CoV-2 is a virus. And viruses are interesting species in that they live somewhere between the non-living and the living condition. Well, what do I mean by that? Most students have no, have no difficulty in identifying non-living objects, rocks, ice, water, air, even the sun is non-living. And for examples of living, they can certainly find animals, plants, or possibly things that have animal plant-like features. So if we look at two different categories of non-living and living, there's a distinction. As far as science, how do we differentiate the two? Well, in the living, we look at a set of characteristics that we use to differentiate the living condition. And those include responding to stimuli, using energy, growing and changing, a metabolism. For younger students, we call this the sum total of the chemical reactions because a living thing, an organism, is always undergoing various types of reactions. And some of them use energy. Actually, every organism has to use some of those reactions that use energy to get enough energy so that it can carry on the living process. Also reproduction, which is different from replication. Reprodu reproduction is where the organism itself makes copies of itself. Replication is something different and that's what viruses do. Viruses, in fact, we look at this whole list of living characteristics, guess what? Viruses don't do any of them. It's incredible. Viruses replicate. That's pretty much about all that viruses do. And finally, cells have what's called cellular organization, or living things all have cellular organization, whether they're unicellular or multicellular critters. Here we have an example of a cell. And let's take a look at some of that cell structure. The basic unit of life is the cell. It carries on all of the life processes. As mentioned, it has structure and function and it has cell organelles. The main organelle that you're probably familiar with is the nucleus, the old control center. Within the control center, we have DNA, the cell blueprints. What makes the cell blueprints so important is that they carry the code for making a material called proteins. And proteins really gives your body the structural elements of its being. And you need to have blueprints for making protein. And these blueprints are all safeguarded in the inner sanctum of the cell, that cell nucleus. We have other components in a cell. We have the organelles called the mitochondria. I mentioned energy before. This is the organelle from which the cell gets its energy. You have an outer cell membrane. You have an inner cell membrane. Again, these membranes are made of similar structure. They are a lipid bimembrane. And those of you that know high school science realize that this is kind of a fatty substance, a sandwich of these lipid layers. Also, the inner membrane is found in what's called the ER, endo, uh, endo, uh, <laughs> endoplasmic reticulum getting a little bit tongue tied there. And uh, this set of membranes has attached to it the ribosomes or the protein factories. And these are the factories that make the protein based upon the blueprints which were kept in the nucleus, copies were made and carried on RNA out 
of the nucleus to these protein factories and they produce the protein. What about a virus? I said before, viruses really are so simplistic. They don't perform those characteristics of life. Their organization reflects this simplicity. Basically, they are made of some sort of external protein shell. Sometimes it's integrated with the blueprints and also blueprints for making more viruses. That's it. That is the basic structure of a virus. Many of them have more chemicals, more proteins added, but in general, these are the two basic parts of the virus. So the protein shell is made of building blocks called capsomeres, and you can see the art connections that are here. And again, we're talking and looking at science topics for teaching of STEM. Within that sanctum, we have the blueprints. And when it comes to virus, it could either be DNA, which you have in your cells, or RNA blueprints. And these blueprints are protected by the protein shell, and that protein shell encapsulates them, keeping them safe from the outer environment. Many viruses have another layer. Coronaviruses have that outer by lipid layer, that bilayer lipid that I mentioned before, that fatty layer, which wraps that inner core of a protein blueprint mix in that fatty membrane. And then that membrane is studded with proteins, the S proteins. And those S proteins are very important and they play a role in antibodies and antigens in the development of vaccines. If we look at SARS, CoV-2, and we want to find out the structure of this, well, let's take a deeper dive. It is mostly spherical. So they're mostly spherical, and you can see that in the scanning electron microscope. And these mostly spherical viruses are quite small. How small are they? Well, I can give you this in nanometers, but that means nothing to most students. However, to look at the concept of the head of the pin and imagine, and again, this gets hard to imagine, but it's, it's incredible. You can place over 15,000 viruses across the head of a pin end to end. That is how small the SARS-CoV-2 virus is. And here we have an example of that virus in terms of its size comparison to a cell that it might infect. And remember, those cells are the respiratory cells that line the upper part of the respiratory system, and they have certain receptors on their surface. They're called ACE2 receptors. They are enzymes found on the surface of these receptors, which fit, make a fit. They make contact with that SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which sets in motion a series of actions which allows the SARS-CoV-2 virus to present its blueprints into the potential host cell. Again, math connections, we can look at modeling the scale. Getting back to our virus CoV-2, I mentioned that fabric covering. Uh, the fabric covering, by the way, is similar to that fabric which is found in the inner membranes of the hosts that it infects. In fact, the replicating, the new virus particles, rip out a swatch of that fabric and they wrap themselves in this as they assemble. So part of that virus particle that's out there in the air circulating, part of its outer membrane has actually been torn from the cell which it infected. And you can see that membrane right there. That's the area that scientists believe those membranes are ripped off from. We also have within that viral envelope protein studs. And I mentioned before that S or the spike protein. Within the virus, we have the blueprints. And the blueprints in SARS-CoV-2 are in the form of ribonucleic acid, RNA, and we can look at a version which I might share with upper elementary or middle school students. 
And this gives you another chance to model, bring in that art connection to STEM. So we're looking at STEAM connections where students can make models of the viruses. For high school, if we look at the SARS-CoV-2 genome, we have a whole area that opens up in both biology and chemistry, and you know what, and also in mathematics. And here you can see a representation of the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and it has about 30,000 nucleotides, building blocks, and I've profiled three segments of that genome. One of the segments is responsible for encoding the protease, one of the proteases that the virus has, which chops up the larger proteins into usable pieces of protein. Another is involved in the replication of the virus, the RNA replicase. And another is the length of the genome, which has the code for making that spike or the S protein. What about stages of virus replication? If we look at that at a lower sophistication level, we can break that down into three simple steps. One is that the virus needs to invade the cell. So the viruses are circulating in the air around us, and they may be circulating as aerosols, they may be circulating on droplets, they might be on a contaminated surface, and when you bring that to your mouth, these viruses then have an opportunity to make physical contact with cells that present that ACE2 receptor. And once they make that contact, they are brought into the cell, or actually what is released inside the cell is that virus blueprint. So the cell makes contact, excuse me, the virus makes contact with the cell. The cell blueprint is revealed inside of the cell. The cell blueprint then takes over those protein making cell parts, the ribosomes, and it redirects the ribosomes to make more viruses and make more virus protein and also to set in motion making more copies of the virus blueprints. So suddenly we are making more new viruses. Once those viruses are made within the infected cell, they are released into the environment. And that is virus replication. And that is all that a virus does, is it takes over a cell, injects its own blueprints, and has the cell use its hijacked cellular machinery to make the products of new viruses, the new viruses assemble within that infected cell, and they are released into the environment. What about the future? And you know, I've got to look at my crystal ball here. And in this future, I find there's a new normal. And like most scientists, I see that this new normal is all about vaccines. And what are vaccines? Well, the basic part of vaccines and how vaccines will protect us depends upon the antigen antibody reaction. Go take a look at my latest YouTube movie, my lesson on immune cells, you'll learn more about that, or go to one of my blogs and you'll get a deeper dive. But antigens are foreign substances to the body. Many of them are proteins. And what these do is they, they initiate, they trigger an immune response. And that immune response is the production of antigen specific proteins called antibodies. So if your body detects an antigen, it makes antibodies. And what it does with these antibodies is that these antibodies are then able to bind to the specific antigens. In this case, I have antibodies binding to the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And this is the major, the major way we plan to develop or the major strategies of vaccinations against COVID-19. We are going to develop a process in which the body develops a high concentration of antibodies through vaccination so that when the actual virus is presented, those 
antigens on the virus, those spike proteins, are covered and cloaked and deactivated by the antibodies that your body has already produced. And normally it takes somebody about three weeks, two to three weeks to get detectable antibodies. So it's not quick. There's other types of immune reactions, but you can learn about those from my blogs or my lessons. Vaccines. Vaccines have been around for a while, even before Jenner did the classical work with, with cowpox. Uh, vaccinations were looked at for centuries prior to that. And vaccinations come in two flavors, or the traditional ones came in two flavors. One were called attenuated vaccines. The others were called inactivated vaccines. Attenuated vaccines involve using weakened pathogens. So when you get injected with one of these vaccines, you actually get a mild infection. You get a mild infection from that pathogen. However, the organisms that have been injected into you have been weakened, so they don't cause the full-blown symptoms. And in response to that infection, your body produces a very good load of antibodies, and it protects you from measles or from the mumps. The other type of traditional vaccination was the inactivated. These are really the chopped up or the dead bacteria or the chopped up viruses. And these are killed pathogens and the pathogen parts. You can get injected with these. Your body recognizes the antigens and then will develop antibodies against them. The problem with inactivated vaccines is that since you really don't get that disease in a, in a modified, in a weakened way, it's not as effective as in creating a load of antibodies. Therefore, you need boosters. And this is true with polio. So you would need multiple injections. And it seems like for SARS-CoV-2, we might need multiple injections of vaccines. Some of the cool SARS-CoV-2 vaccines are ones that use nucleic acids. And this is a whole new generation of vaccines that uses RNA or DNA. And this might be our salvation for getting vaccinations out there and not waiting a decade because these vac vaccines are really tailor-made to what we need and they can be developed and produced in the laboratory at light speed. You know, if you look at the, the, at the warp speed uh, program that the U.S. has in getting, I believe, 300 million doses of vaccines available to U.S. citizens by the end of this year, who knows, hopefully this will happen. Uh, because as I said, most scientists see vaccination as being really a way of addressing the spread of SARS-CoV-2 and bringing us up to a more familiar new normal. What these nucleic acid vaccines do is that these nucleic acid vaccines hijack the cell's protein factories and redirect them to manufacture virus proteins. One of you, well, one of them, the Moderna vaccine is probably one that you've heard of. It's an RNA vaccine. And what this vaccine has is the blueprints for making spike protein. It doesn't have the blueprints for making the whole COVID-19 virus, just for making those spikes. And it's encoded in RNA, one of the nucleic acids, and the delivery to your cells is by spherical sacs called liposomes. And again, if we're looking at bioengineering, what a great way of bringing this to students at the high school level for understanding this, maybe conceptually coming up with different types of nucleic acid vaccines. But we have the spherical sacs called a liposome, and these are lipid. Huh? Remember lipid from the membranes? And there's a reason for it. Nanoparticles. And there we have that particle. Notice that that lipid spherical sac, the composition looks similar to how we represent cell membranes. Interesting. Within that, we place the RNA blueprint for making spike proteins. We deliver these nanoparticles with an injection to an individual. Once released into the bloodstream, these nanoparticles travel to cells. There, their exterior membrane recognizes the exterior membrane. They're so both lipids, the RNA, goes into the cell, goes to the ribosomes. The ribosomes make spike proteins. 
your body reacts to the presence of this foreign antigen. In response, it builds antibodies and you get protected. That's one of the vaccines. The other vaccine is called the Oxford vaccine. And this is another main contender. And the Oxford vaccine, similar, yep. Uh, and I've got a few minutes left. We'll be finishing this up. The Oxford vaccine uses the DNA code. Hello? Yes. The DNA code for making spike S protein. And this uses a virus from the chimpanzee to bring that code into the cell. Gets injected. The DNA travels to the nucleus. Within the nucleus, we have that code being sent to the ribosomes. The ribosomes, as you saw in the DNA version, kick out spike proteins. We have antibodies, and that protects you. All right, let's bring this presentation to closure right now. I think you've got to look at this concept of COVID-19 pandemic as a new way for educators to assume a different role in education. Actually, I have other webinars. You can find them on how educators need to retool and develop a hybrid type, a blended approach for using online and face-to-face -to, -face to become effective educators. And I want to thank you right now for joining me in this presentation. And remember, please come to my Twitter, at mdespezio, sign up for those tweets, and you will be kept up to, up to date about the latest in research and what this means to STEM educators from kindergarten through college. Also, if you'd like to learn more about the specifics, if your biology background is not that strong, visit me or come to my blogs and you will get a very comprehensive background to understanding COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 viruses. And on this note, I want to bring this to pass the baton back to my host. Great. Thank you, uh, Michael. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. That was really, really informative. And since we still have two minutes, there was um, one question I really wanted you to answer was, what type of hands-on investigation, if any, might be appropriate where data observation using slash developing models might be employed, then tied to argument-driven inquiry individual students might do? Great. And a few activities that you can certainly tweak to those specifics of, of that question. Um, you know, offhand, I can think of some that I have worked on. And again, they're posted at that HMH site. Go to my Twitter. But give you an example of one is evaluating the effectiveness of hand washing. Uh, and you can do that in a number of different ways of using uh, one way that I do it simplistic is having students come up with a slurry and they rub the slurry on their hands uh, and they can actually get a sensation of touch. Again, this is highly subjective and get an idea of infection of particles that are on the surface. Then they can apply various hand washing techniques they can use water. They can use soap and water. They can vary the amount of time of hand washing. Of course, remember, looking back at hand washing, you need to wash it for at least 20 seconds. And to compare subjectively with what do I have at the end of that? Do I feel the particles? How can we register them? You can certainly do swab tests. You can swab those areas. And then you can develop other tests for finding out, not the old type of bacterial tests. Those have been taken out of the lab. But you can do other types of assays to determine what has come around and what has been transferred. So, yes, there are a number of actual modeling techniques that you can use to look at the spread. Other examples might be developing different types of fabric face masks and then using a spray bottle 
finding out if there is a way of putting on one side of that. And this is a, an activity I'm going to develop and, and put out on the on the site, which has a paper in which then you can get some sort of quantitative measure for how much of that liquid actually does travel through that face covering. But there's quite a few. There is quite a few. You right. know, I'm looking at developing a, a curriculum. Uh, and if I get the sponsors, I'll be putting it out that will have a hundred of these activities. But for now, go to my Twitter. You'll find them there. Great. Thank you so much, Michael. And just for the participants, Michael's going to be with us tomorrow. He's also going to have a chat session on Thursday. So I personally found this really, really informative. I thought it was excellent. And I'm really looking forward to hearing it again tomorrow as well. So thank, thank you so you. much, Michael. You're and welcome. we'll see you tomorrow. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. All right.